Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah Alhamdulillahi hamdan yuafi ni'amahu wa yukafi wa mazidah Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilman ya kareem Before the break we were discussing the four things, the four concepts that are poisonous to the heart of an individual now that we know what exactly is it that causes these sicknesses of the heart, we now need to find out some of the ways a person can you know, use towards replenishing and rejuvenating his or her heart. And some of them we've already mentioned. So who, who can remember one or two or more or less? Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, in general, the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But particularly in that, in that hadith, what did the Prophet sallallahu say? Yeah, that and there was one more. Dhikr of something else though. Remembering death. Remembering death. So, the first thing that we need to look at is remembering death because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that there. So we have already mentioned that so we don't need to look into it in detail. But the first thing being remembering death. And the Prophet ﷺ used to tell us all the time to remember death more. أَكْثِرُ مِنْ ذِكْرِ هَادِ مِنْ Remember the action or the affair that is destructive to the desires. And remember earlier on we mentioned that the category, there's two different types of you know, sins or two different types of calamities of the heart. What are the two different types? I asked you yesterday, Uthman. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Shubuhat and Shahawat. They both start with the sheen. The two sheens. The two sheens of death. Or the death of the heart. So, here the Prophet is saying, when you remember death, it destroys these ladhat, these shahawat. It destroys a person's desire and his zeal for committing sin because he realizes he realizes what's coming. He realizes what's heading his way. So you have shubuhat and you have shahawat. So the death over here will work towards fixing that problem entirely. Then you have the second thing which is the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does the word dhikr mean? What does the word dhikr mean? Huh? Remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Good answer. How do you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Somebody answer, otherwise I'll pick a hand. You in the corner. Safar, yeah. Saying, Safarullah Tawiri. That's a good way to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, dhikr means to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas the word dhukr with a dhamma on top, it means to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the heart. When you say dhikr, it is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the tongue. Whereas when you say dhukr, it is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the heart. And the best of dhikr is when you're saying astaghfirullah and you're thinking about that sin that you've committed. So you have dhikr and dhukr together, both states of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put together. 
Because you know, the mere fact that you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the heart, merely that in and of itself is a virtue. That in and of itself is a virtue. So for that reason the ulama they said that the best of dhikr is where dhikr also is involved. Where you also remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time with the heart. When you're saying astaghfirullah, think about the fact that you've sinned. Think about the fact that you have committed something and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be covering the sin up for you as the word ghafara means. To cover And when you say atubu ilayhi, think about the fact that the example of you is the example of a slave that ran away from his master. And now he's coming back to Allah, his master. So that when you actually make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there really is some fruit out of it. When you say astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi, you really feel it. You might say it a hundred times, but if you say it in this manner, it might be better than that hundred times. Where you put your energy into the zikr, zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You remember Allah the way He should be remembered. And really, zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at large, it is a cure. It is a cure. And that's why, makhul. رضي الله تعالى عنه ورحم. He used to say, ذكر ذكر الله شفاء. Remembering Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is a cure. Cure for the sicknesses that occur. And at the same time, filling your heart up with the remembrance of someone besides Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is a sickness. And that's why he continued and he said, ذكر الناس دا. Look at yourself. Put yourself in check. Is it a musician? A rap artist? Is it a basketball player that you think about? Or is it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Even for people that are practicing. And they think about people, figures. Is it a Shaykh Al Fulani that you think of? Is it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you think of? If you come into a situation where you feel that I will do such and such and it would look weird in front of people, is it Allah you're thinking of? Or is it people that you think of? Is it the honor? that you wish to seek in the eyes of that individual that you love or is it the honor that you seek in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that's why Makhul said dhikrullahi dawa'un wa dhikrul nasi da'un and the best of dhikr, however, is what? Is reciting the Qur'an. And that's why Allah's Prophet ﷺ, when he was recommending the cure, he said, reciting the Qur'an. But in general, dhikr in and of itself is a cure. Dhikr in and of itself is a cure. And that's why Ibn Taymiyyah alayhi, used to say, the example of Dhikr to the heart, remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the heart, is the example of a fish in a pond, in water. What happens to the fish? What happens to the fish when it's taken out of this water? What happens? Tell me. What happens? It dies. It dies. It can no longer live. Similarly, when you take the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of your heart, your heart begins to die. 
So the example, and that's why Allah's Prophet والسلام, what did he say? He said, مَثَلُ الَّذِي يَذْكُرُ رَبَّهُ The example of the individual that remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the example of another that doesn't remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala كمثل الحي والميت The example of these two people is the example of the one alive and the one dead. Because out of that remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does the heart find rest. And with that remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does the heart find himself alive, itself alive. So ponder what Ibn Taymiyyah is saying, it's a very balanced statement. But the example of your heart, O child of Adam, is the example of a fish. If you take the fish out of water, it dies. Similarly your heart, if you take the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of this heart, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of this heart, then it begins to die. So, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we said, it's the best types of dhikr though. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the best type of dhikr. It, in and of itself, has both types of cures. We talked about dhikr al maut remembering death. And we said, Remembering death helps you cure the desires. This right here, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again and again, Allah strikes parables to show you and clarify for you the doubts that are casted by society. That are casted by people. But Allah cures these doubts in His book. And at the same time, it's an admonition and a cure for that which is in the heart. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in His book. Time in and time out. Shifa'un lima fi sudu. That it is a cure for that which is in the heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that it is a cure for that which is in the heart. Allah says, Mu'adha. He calls it a Mu'adha. The amongst the names that He gave it in the Quran is that it's a Mu'adha, it's an admonition. Allah talks about the people that recite this book. They fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And says that shivers go down their spine. And they begin to have goosebumps. So that, all of that, just to cure what? Just to cure what? The desires. Because when you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and when you're reminded of death time in and time out, then what happens? What happens? Answer. Answer. What happens? I'm talking to myself here. What happens? Huh? It revives the heart of sicknesses that are pertaining to desires. So for that reason, uh, also reciting the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amongst the cures. And another cure is making istighfar. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the people that make istighfar and He said, مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا أَوْ يَظْلِمْ نَفْسَهُ ثُمَّ يَسْتَغْفِرِ اللَّهِ يَجِدِ اللَّهِ تَوَابًا رَحِيمًا Whoever 
commits a sin or transgresses upon his own soul. ثُمَّ يَسْتَغْفِرِ اللَّهِ And then he goes and repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeks his forgiveness. He'll find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always one that accepts repentance. Tawaba. And at the same time, he'll find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala oft merciful. So Allah wishes for his slave to repent. If you sinned, repent. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his prophet, he said in a hadith, he said, if you weren't to sin, commit sin, لَوْلَمْ تُذْنِبُوا If you weren't to commit sins, لَذَهَبَ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have taken you away from the face of the earth. And then he said, he would have brought people that sinned so that they can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him. So if you have sinned, you have transgressed upon your soul, Allah wishes for you to seek His forgiveness. And in that way and only that way can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name Ghaffar be manifested. Allah has a title. The one that accepts repentance. The one that forgives. And if a slave is not sitting and not asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, then that name cannot be manifested. So Allah wishes for you to ask for repentance. And if you don't, Allah's Prophet ﷺ is saying, hey, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would take you away from the face of the earth. And he would bring people that would sin also that they can ask for forgiveness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would then forgive them. And asking tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really important. Because Allah calls the people that don't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, what? Transgressors. Because they've placed something in a place that they shouldn't have placed it in. Allah says, Whoever doesn't ask for forgiveness, verily these people are the ones that are transgressors upon their souls. So because of that, the ulama, they said people are of only two types. The one type being people that ask for forgiveness. The other type is another individual that doesn't seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. The first, Allah gave him a title and He called him a ta'ib. He called him one that seeks repentance. That repents back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other, Allah called him someone that transgresses upon himself. So it's either... You're between one of two people. Check yourself. Are you someone that repents back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Whenever he sins, whenever she sins? Or are you one that does dhulm? You know what dhulm means, right? The ulama, they say that the word dhulm means to place something where it shouldn't be placed. Now this is a question. It should be placed on a table. But if I throw it down there, then I'm doing wool to this paper. So the thing that you should be placing with your tongue is repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you don't do that, you transgressed. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls these people transgressors that don't repent back to Allah. And repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wajib by the consensus of the Islamic scholars. It's an obligation. Brother, sister, just as you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should be repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our dear Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he realized that. And that's why you find him saying, Wallahi. إِنِّي لَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ فِي الْيَوْمِ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةً That by Allah, I ask 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me. Wa atubu ilayhi fi liyawmi sab'ina marra. That I ask Allah to forgive me and I repent back to Allah on a daily basis 70 times. Talk about the individual of whom all the sins have been forgiven. Those that came and those that were to come. And they were not. The Prophet ﷺ didn't sin. A mistake is one thing, a sin is another. But even if there were, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them. And he's making repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 70 times in a day. And Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, إِن كُنَّا لَنَعُدُّ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ فِي الْمَجْلِسِ الْوَاحِدِ يَقُولُوا رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَتُبْ عَلَيَّ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ That we would hear the Prophet ﷺ in one gathering, just like this one right here. You're sitting in one gathering, just like this one right here. Ibn Umar is saying in one gathering, we'd hear the Prophet ﷺ saying, رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَتُبْ عَلَيَّ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ O my Lord, forgive me and accept my repentance. Verily, you are the one who accepts repentance. And you are the all merciful. Did you hear the Prophet ﷺ saying this? How many times? A hundred times in one gathering. Not in a day. What about us? Put yourself in check. Ask yourself. Then you ask, why is it that my iman is low? Did you make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? For that sin you committed yesterday, today, last week, the day before. Did you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you? If you harmed another soul, did you ask that individual to forgive you? Because Allah's Prophet said, لَتُؤَدُّنَّ الْحُقُوقِ Verily you will surely deliver all the rights that you have upon other people. حَتَّى يُقَادَ لِلْشَّاتِ الْجَلْحَاءِ مِنَ الشَّاتِ الْقَرْنَى To an extent where you have a sheep with horns or a goat with horns it will have to repay to one that didn't have horns. Because in the barn, it went and hit the one without the horns. So on the day of judgment, the one with the horns will be brought forth in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And another one without the horns will be brought in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And both of them will have to repay to each other if one had armed the other. So how about us? This is animals. You will be asked, what did you do? How did you take the money of Fulan and never give it back to him? How did you say that evil word about Fulan and never asked him for forgiveness? How did you physically abuse somebody and never asked him for forgiveness? You'll be asked, just as that goat will be asked. And one may ask, however, what exactly is the relation between seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What exactly is the relation between that and the revival of the heart? We have to go back to that statement of Qatada radiallahu ta'ala rahimahullah where he said inna hadha al-Qur'an verily this book guides you yadullukum ila da'ikum wa dawa'ikum it guides you to your sickness just as it does to the cure fa amma da'ukum as for your sickness 
Qatada rahimahullah said, فالذنوب. As for the sickness, then this is the sins, all of the sins, including being angry, including having hasad and jealousy, including physically abusing somebody, including stealing, including every single sin. They all work towards putting a black dot in everybody's heart, in the sinner's heart. وَأَمَّا دَوَاءُكُمْ Qatada continued and he said, As for the cure, he said, فَالِسْتِغْفَارِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told you what that cure is. If you have sin, if you have committed harm to another brother, another sister, then go, repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And do it seriously. And do it with all the conditions of repentance there and complete. What are the conditions of repentance? Sorry? First you should accept that you committed that. Accept? I identify uh, that you should feel that you can do that. Okay, remorse. Yeah. Then uh, you should feel, isn't that the second feeling remorse would be second because you know that you committed that. Okay. And then you know that you committed? I don't know of that being a condition. Because when you're remorse, naturally you recognize the fact that that it is a sin. That's why you have remorse. So remorse, having the intention to never go back to that sin, al-azmu ala alla ya'ud, wal-iqla'. And also to retract, that you never go and commit that sin again. And some of the other, other ulama, they included in that two more conditions. That you do it with a sincere intention towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sincerity is the must, first of all, first and foremost. First and foremost is sincerity. And then, you have to do it before it's too late, before you die. Because when Fir'aun said, La ilaha illallah, before his death, it was too late for him now. It was right when he was going through the agony of death. So you have to do it before your time's up. And you have to do it before the day of judgment comes, if you are alive during that time. So five conditions. But there is a sixth. For those that have harmed a particular individual. And it's not between you and Allah anymore. It's not between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anymore. You do have a sin when it comes to your accounts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for harming this individual because Allah had forbidden it. Forbidden it. But at the same time, you still have another thing on your account and that's between you and the individual that you've harmed. So over here some of the ulama they said you have to tell the individual. Some of the ulama they said you have to tell the individual. I believe it to be the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa. And other ulama they said that you don't have to tell this individual because usually that will lead to a bigger problem. And that being the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah rahmahullah. So if an individual has harmed another person, you did say something wrong about another person. 
then not only do you have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, but you also have to seek repentance or ask this individual to overlook your sin. So long as that doesn't leave, lead you to a bigger problem. If it does lead you to a bigger problem, then the way to solve that is go into that same sort of gathering. Let's say it was me, Zaid and Amr. We're sitting together, we're discussing about... Give me a name, Ahmed. And we were saying all sorts of bad things. May Allah forgive us. So the way to seek repentance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such a thing, if Ahmed was a mean guy, or he wouldn't accept from us, is that we come together in a similar majlis and say good things about that individual. So that statement or that good statement that you're making can almost be like an expiation for the bad statement that you made. And Allah may or may not forgive you for this because He doesn't know as of yet. He may or may not. So the best thing to do is not to speak to begin with. And keep your tongue to yourself. Keep yourself quiet. So this is in terms of tawbah. Repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you have another cause or mean for replenishing and rejuvenating the heart. And that being making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because dua in and of itself is worship. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it worship in and of itself. And those people that have been through calamities and they've raised their hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they know what I'm talking about. The closest or one of the closest states that you can feel to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when you raise your hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you have nothing but Allah on your side. You think everything else has shut, your, shut their doors upon you. But it's just you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you raise your hands to Allah and then you realize how close you can get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by calling to Allah. And Allah knew this. He's the creator of the human being. So He knows how it works. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it the essence of worship. When He said, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ ادْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And your Lord said, Ud'uni, call out to me. أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ I will reply to your call. Allah replies to the call of the caller. Who is it that will reply to the call of the caller besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي Those that are arrogant, they become arrogant from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here it is. Over here Allah is calling the dua. He said, call out to me and I'll answer. Who is it that will become arrogant or those they become arrogant from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he called the dua over here, the worship. As in it in and of itself is a major portion of the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Calling out to Allah. Seeking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah loves that. Let us Adam Don't ask. the child of Adam, anything. Why? The poet continues and he says, the reason is because the child of Adam becomes mad when you ask him. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes mad when you don't ask him. Allah loves for his slave to ask. And ask again. And if you don't get your answer, keep asking. 
And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ مَا لَمْ يُعَجِّلُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers your call so long as you're not hasty. He'll answer your call. Just hang on. Don't be hasty about it. And Allah will answer, but the manifestation of that answer, dear brother, dear sister, might be different. You may or may not recognize how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted your call. And that's why Allah's Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, he said in a hadith, ma min muslim. There's never a believer, bid'u bi da'watin, he calls out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a question, a supplication. لَيْسَ فِيهَا إِثْمٌ وَلَا قَطِيعَةُ رَحِمٍ إِلَّا أَعْطَاهُ اللَّهُ إِحْدَى ثَلَاثٍ you don't find in this supplication that he had done to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a sin. Nor do you find him breaking ties of kin because of this supplication that he's made. Except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives them one of three things. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them what he asks for. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Gives him what he's asked for. If he asked for wealth, Allah will give it to him. It's one of those things. Or the Prophet said, وَإِمَّا أَنْ يَدَّخِرَهَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ Either that, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves it for the day of judgment. So that it comes in the form of a good deed for this individual on the day of judgment. Either this, either that. Or Allah's Prophet said, وَإِمَّا أَنْ يَصْرِفَ عَنْهُمْ مِنَ السُّوءِ مِثْلَهَا It's either he gives it to him, he saves it for him, for the day of judgment, or he deflects a calamity that was to befall him otherwise, if he hadn't called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you ask, for Allah, when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, He knows best whether you should have it or not. So he may give it to you, or he may save this call of yours as a good deed. Remember we said, calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in and of itself is a good deed, is worship. So he may save it for you for the day of judgment, so that that worship doesn't go in vain, that worship doesn't go to waste. Or, you might have a problem heading your way and you don't know about. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the blessings from this worship that you did and deflects that evil that you didn't ask for because you didn't know it was heading your way. So amongst the ways an individual can perfect and cleanse this heart is by calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, supplicating out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this being one of the ways. And the last way that I'd like to mention is, and with that being said, inshallah ta'ala, we'll also conclude the session for today. And if there's any questions, we'll stop for that for a bit as well. Is being ascetic when it comes to the dunya. For verily, the dunya is worthless. The dunya may have some worth in your eyes. Brother, may have some worth in your eyes, sister. May have some worth in my eyes. But the reality is, it has no worth in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He had His Prophet say, لَوْ كَانَتِ الدُّنْيَا تَعْدِلُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ جَنَاحَ بَعُوضَةٍ If the dunya, the questions after, inshallah ta'ala. Is that a question or... What was that? We'll ask for the questions later on, Shalta. From what? I can't hear. From what? <laughs> 
yeah, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. But anyways, if as a general rule, if you have a question, save it for after. Um, so, if it was worth something in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he wouldn't have had his Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam say, لو كانت الدنيا تعدل عند الله جناح بعوضة ما سقى منها كافر شربتنا that if the world was worth anything in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he wouldn't have given a kafir even a sip of water. Allah's Prophet said, if it was worth even the amount of weight a feather of a mosquito is, that size that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't have given a kafir even a sip of water from it. But he did. So it isn't. He gave people at large in big numbers. Do you not see people driving the best of cars, eating the loftiest of meals? Riding in the most comfortable of rides and mounts. All of that just to prove to you that it's not worth anything in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not worth anything in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look at the example of the Prophet himself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never chooses for his Prophet except the best of situations. And you have the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. His wife saying what? كان يمر بنا هلال ثم هلال ثم هلال ولم يوقد في بيتنا النار. That a month used to go go by, and yet another used to go by, and another used to go by. And for the entire set of three months, we never had fire lit in our house. I.e., they weren't cooking meat. And when they asked Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, they said, then how did you used to live, O oh, Aisha? She said, with the two black things, as in water and dates. That's all they used to have. So if it was worth something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He would have given it to the most worthy of creation. creation. His creation. And that's why Allah's, Allah's Prophet والسلام, recognized that. Allah's Prophet والسلام, recognized that. So what did he say? He said, Allahumma ja'al. Rizqa Ali Muhammad al Quta. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make the sustenance of the child of the family of Muhammad in just that which they require to nourish. Because he recognized that the rest of wealth is in vain, it's pointless. He recognized and he understood and he really believed what he was saying when he said that if a person wakes up peacefully in the morning and he has a healthy body and he has a meal, then the whole of dunya has been summed up for him. He recognized that. But even then, if the Prophet ﷺ even mistakenly would look to the dunya, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? He said, and this is one of my favorite verses in the Quran. He said, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِي وَالْقُرْآنَ الْعَظِيمِ لا تمدن عينيك إلى ما متعنا به أزواجا منهم ولا تحزن عليهم واخفض جناحك للمؤمنين. He said, Verily, we have given to you the seven oft repeated. Verses. Sabah min al-mathani. 
And we have given to you this great book called Al-Quran. How dare you then extend your gaze to something else? لا تمد العينك Do not extend your gaze to that which we have given to anybody else at that point. O Prophet of Allah wasallam. If we have given to you Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is comparing the dunya, all of it, to Surah Al-Fatiha. Just Surah Al-Fatiha. Imagine the whole Qur'an. We've given you Surah Al-Fatiha. Along with that, we've also given you the whole Qur'an. How dare you extend your gaze to something else after that? Because it's worthless. And Allah says it. Implicitly in this verse, explicitly in the hadith we previously mentioned, it's worthless in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't seek your wealth, your money, from anywhere where there's a doubt in. It might seem promising to you today, but on the day of judgment, when your belly is burning with the fire of hell, it won't be that promising anymore. It won't be that promising anymore. I know it. The love of the dunya can slowly extend to an individual's heart. Look at the example of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. Abu Hanifa and Nu'man he used to be a tradesman. He used to sell and buy, buy and sell. And one day he gave a lot of merchandise to his business partner. And he sent him off to go and sell. He sent him off to go and sell this merchandise. So as the individual was walking and he sold all of this merchandise of Abu Hanifa, which was worth nearly 30,000 dinars. Abu Hanifa before leaving, he told him that there is one piece of cloth that's defective in all of these merchandise. So before you sell, oh my business partner, make sure that you're able to explain to the person that's buying that this cloth here is defective. So we don't eat that which is haram. And just for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qadr to pass, this individual forgot. When he sold these clothes and all this merchandise. And when he came back to Abu Hanifa and he asked him, or Abu Hanifa asked him, what did you do with all those clothes and all that merchandise? He said, I sold it. Did you explain to that individual that there was a thobe that was defective? He said, I forgot. Abu Hanifa, he gave all of that 30,000 in sadaqah just so a morsel of haram doesn't go into his belly. This is what I mean when I say being a sadiq in the dunya, not leaving off wealth, but leaving off things that have doubts. So that your belly is pure of haram. So you don't be amongst those peoples about who the Prophet ﷺ said any piece of flesh that has been nurtured with that which is haram فَالنَّارُ أَوْلَى بِهِ Then verily, hellfire is more worthy of this piece of flesh because it was nurtured and catered with that which was haram and with that being said we'll stop وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين